Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 10. And it is our plan to cover chapter 10, chapter 11, and chapter 12. All three chapters. It's a new year, so we're going to try some new things. And this is one of them. So, place your faith in the Lord tonight, and we will get through this. I want to read the last verse of chapter 9 before we jump into our study. The first nine chapters of Second Chronicles dealt with Solomon. And verse 31 says, And Solomon slept with his fathers, and he was buried in the city of David his father, and Rehoboam his son reigned in his stead. Now, if you remember from our studies, or from your studies, the first king of Israel was Saul. He was king for 40 years. The problem with Saul was he had no heart for the Lord. Therefore, God removed Saul and he established David to be the second king of Israel. And David served 40 years as king. And he served the Lord with his whole heart. As a matter of fact, Stephen in the book of Acts says he was a man after God's own heart. His son, Solomon, takes the throne. He serves for 40 years years but he served the Lord half-hearted and now his son Rehoboam takes the throne in our study tonight and the title of our study is Rehoboam's reign and his problem is he has a weak heart Proverbs 423 says guard your heart for out of it flow all the issues of life. Guard your heart. Just like physically our heart pumps within our chest and with every pump, it's circulating blood through our entire system, oxygen, blood, and all the rest to keep us healthy, to keep us alive. Spiritually speaking, our, our heart is just as vital. Therefore, the Lord says, guard it because out of it flows all the issues of life. And we're going to see in Rehoboam's case, the heart is important. In chapter 10, we're going to see him forsaking counsel. So let's jump in since we have so much to cover, and I want to prove the naysayers wrong. I would ask you to raise your hands if... You're one of them, but I'm not going to do that tonight. Because I know some of you thought, what? <laughs> and Rehoboam went to Shechem. For to Shechem were all Israel come to make him king. Shechem was up north. It was the epicenter of the tribes up at the north. So it was a smart political move for him to go up there to, to show that he was representing them. And it says in verse 2, And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was in Egypt, whether he had fled from the presence of Solomon the king, heard it, that Jeroboam returned out of Egypt. Uh, Jeroboam was an up-and-coming, rising star. He was one of Solomon's servants. If you remember, we're going to be introduced to Shimei again, a uh, a prophet came to him one day when he was just walking along a field. He walked up, took off his robe, tore it into 12 pieces, handed him 10 pieces, and said, because of the sin of Solomon and Israel, you are going to have 10 of the tribes, and the remainders are going to stay in Judah for David my servant's sake. Which is really interesting and powerful, because Solomon was the most powerful king that ruled Israel. Wasn't the greatest, but... He was the most powerful. And God comes along and says, I can just pick a man off the street and make him king. That should encourage us 
because far too many Christians sit in pews week after week and think, I'm nothing special. God can't use me. God can use anyone, especially if they're willing to be usable. So Jeroboam's been hiding out in Egypt because Solomon was threatened by him. And he took off, and now he's making his way back because Solomon is out of the picture. Verse 3, we find the request. It says, They sent and called him, so Jeroboam and all Israel came to speak to Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore ease thou somewhat the grievous servitude of thy father and his heavy yoke that he put upon us, and we will serve thee. Solomon was never satisfied. He was always building. He always wanted more, more, more. And as a result, there was heavy taxation on the people and heavy labor placed upon them. And they were tired of it. And so they saw an opportunity with the change of leadership to say, hey, we just need you to back off a little bit. If you'll do that, if you'll just ease up somewhat, we will serve you. Verse 5, And he said unto them, Come again unto me after three days. And the people departed. He says, Give me three days to think about it. You ever felt like you needed time? There's nothing wrong with taking time, but you just need to make sure that when you're having the time, you make the most of the time and you spend that time wisely. Otherwise, you're just wasting time. He says, I need three days. After three days, I'll get back with you. Verse 6 says, And King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men. I like that. He took counsel with the old men that had stood, notice this, before Solomon. These men, at this point, Rehoboam is 41 years of age. He goes to the old men, those men who stood with Solomon, those men who were part of his inner circle, those who helped him make decisions. Wow. They probably learned a lot from being influenced by Solomon, this wise man, but no doubt he learned from them as well. And so Rehoboam goes to them. And he says, what counsel give ye me to return and answer to this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou be kind to this people, and please them, and speak good words unto them, they will be thy servants forever. 2019, you need some good counsel from some old men? Here's some. It'll work at home. It'll work at school. It'll work at the church. It'll work at the house. It'll work on the job. If you will be kind unto this people and please them and speak good words to them, they will be thy servants forever. That's counterintuitive to many leadership mentalities. Some leaders think, if you will make them hate you enough, they'll work harder for you. Not true. These old men said, hey, we served with your dad. But your dad missed the mark. He drifted away. He forgot the purpose of leadership. It got to the point that the people were something that he used instead of someone that he served. You remember our study of Mark? Mark chapter 10, verse 34, Jesus said, For the, even the Son of Man came not to be ministered, ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. In John 13, Jesus stands up. They've been sitting around the table eating. He takes off his coat, 
He wraps himself with a towel and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. Remember it was Peter said, no way, no how. You're Lord, you're Master, I know who you are, you're not going to do this. And Jesus says, Peter, if you don't let me do this, you have no part with me. And he says, okay, Lord, give me a bath. And he says, Peter, you don't need a bath. You just need me to wash your feet. When he was done, he put his robe back on, he sat back down and he said, do you guys see what I've done? I have did it for an example for you. And then he says this, happy are ye if you do this. The world says leadership is about me. I'm the king of the hill. Everybody's supposed to please me. These old men said, you need to please these people. If you'll do this, if you'll listen to what they're saying, they'll serve you. Verse 8. But he forsook the counsel which the old men gave him, and he took counsel with the young men that were brought up with him and stood before him. He chose to listen to his peers. The problem with only listening to peers is most of the time they only know what you know. They've only experienced what you've experienced. They haven't been where you haven't been. They're where you are at. And so it's smart, it's wise to listen to someone who's been where you're going to help you avoid mistakes along the way. And if you're going to be like Rehoboam and you're going to opinion shop, advice shop, you know what that means. You just keep asking until someone says what you want to hear. Why even bother? Why not just do what you're going to do? Why ask for advice if you're not going to listen to it? And that doesn't mean you have to take it if someone gives it, but he wants some guys that don't know anything more than he knows. And listen to what they tell him, verse 9. And he said unto them, What advice give ye that we may return answer to this people? which have spoken to me, saying, Ease somewhat of the yoke that thy father did put upon us. And the young men that were brought up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou answer the people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it somewhat lighter for us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. <laughs> that sounds tough, don't it? I want to read a passage of Scripture to you. It's found in 1 Kings. If you're taking notes, you can jot it down. It's 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 22 and 23. Now these guys say, you need to go tell these people that my little finger is going to be thicker than your father's loins. Now, I don't know Solomon's size. I don't know if he was a big guy or a little guy, but the Bible does tell us something about his table. So I'm thinking he might have leaned to the heavy side. Listen to this. And Solomon reigned over the kingdom. Nope, wrong verse. 22, I was reading 21. And Solomon's provisions for one day was 30 measures of fine flour, three score measures of meal, 10 fat oxen, and 20 oxen out of the pastures, and 100 sheep, besides hearts, roebucks, fallow deer, and fatted fowl. My little finger is going to be thicker than your father's loins. I doubt it. I doubt it. Verse 11, For whereas my father put a heavy yoke upon you, I will put more to your yoke. If you're meaner, tougher, nastier, louder, more forceful, you'll get your way. You know what Solomon said that Rehoboam never listened to? Proverbs 15.1 a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up strife. 
Rehoboam didn't listen. I guess he had something against old men. He says, my father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Hmm. Aren't you glad that our king is not like Rehoboam? Grievous burdens, heavy yokes. Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If Jesus is into lightening people's burdens, why are we sometimes... Let's just leave that right there. <laughs> so Rehoboam and all the people, verse 12, came to... Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day, and the king bade, saying, Come again to me on the third day. And the king answered them roughly. Now, I've got to confess to you tonight. I have a tendency sometimes to answer roughly. But Jesus says, I am meek and lowly. Do you know the Bible says how forcible are right words? If you're like me, you struggle sometimes with answering roughly. You need to accept the truth of God's word. If you are speaking the truth, you have the authority of heaven behind you. And heaven doesn't need my help. God has spoken and His word stands for eternity. He doesn't need my megaphone. He answered them roughly. You know that James 3.17 says that the wisdom that is from above is first pure it goes on and it says it's peaceable, easy to be entreated, full of mercy. The longer I walk with the Lord, the more meek I should be becoming. If that's not happening, something's wrong in my walk. Because the more I'm becoming like Him, the more I should become like Him. And He says, I am meek and lowly. I'm meek and lowly. He answered rough to them. And he answered them after the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add thereto. My father chastised you with whips. I will chastise you with scorpions. So the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was of God. God didn't make it happen, but he did allow it to happen. It's a sad day when God gives us our will. that the Lord might perform his word, which he spake by the hand of Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. That's in, that's in 1 Kings 11 if you're taking notes. Verse 16, you've got the request, you've got the refusal, and here's the revolt. And when all Israel saw that the king would not hearken unto them, the people answered the king saying, what portion have we in David? We have none inheritance in the son of Jesse. Taxation without representation? Boston Tea Party, they say. We're done with this. And they say, Every man to your tents, O Israel. And now, David, see to thine own house. So all Israel went to their tents. Everyone was very intense. Some of you got it. On Wednesday nights, do we provide coffee next door? It's decaf? We'll fix that. We need to fix that. <laughs> Everyone to your tents, O Israel. But as for the children of Israel that dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them, and King Rehoboam sent Hadaram, that was over the tribute. Now this guy wasn't very bright. 
All the people are angry, so you send an IRS agent to them. And so all of Israel stoned him with stones that he died. But King Rehoboam made speed, got him up into his Air Force One, got to Washington as fast as he could. To flee to Jerusalem, and Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. We move to verse 11, and we see him moving from forsaking counsel to fortifying cities. And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he gathered of the house of Judah and Benjamin an hundred and fourscore thousand chosen men which were warriors to fight against Israel. 180,000 men. And his solution to this problem, there's a division. He sends to get tax from them. They kill the tax guy. And he says, okay, the solution to division is destruction. Civil war. You know, the Bible says, Jesus says, a house divided can't stand. So many houses and churches and offices and places of business, they're full of division. And they wonder how come things aren't happening the way they're supposed to. And some people, once they realize there's division, like Rehoboam, they say, hey, if this ship's going to go down, let's just blow it up. Verse 2 says, But the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, the son of the man of God, saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and all Israel in Judah, and Benjamin, saying. Now, I told you for 2019 you should have listened to the counsel of the old men. You need to hear this too. Thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not go up nor fight against your brethren. Ye shall not go up nor fight against your brethren. Return every man to his house, for this thing is done of me. And they obeyed the words of the Lord and returned from going against Jeroboam. You know, God would rather use addition and multiplication in our lives. That would be his choice. But sometimes, because of our choosing, he has to use subtraction and division. We choose the math. He brings about the solution. The choice is yours. The choice is mine. Do I want God adding and multiplying in my life? Or do I want to have a season of subtraction and division because I've disobeyed him. I've chose not to serve him. Well, verse 5 says, after this, Rehoboam dwelt in Jerusalem and he built cities for defense in Judah. He built Beth Bethlehem and he goes on and he lists all of these cities down to verse 10. In Benjamin, fence cities. Verse 11, he fortified the strongholds. He put captains in them, stores of victual and oil and wine. And in every several city, he put shields and spears and made them exceeding strong, having Judah and Benjamin on his side. He's down there with just those two tribes. Now it's just him defending himself. The ten tribes are up north. They're going to be called Israel from here on. Judah's going to be called for Judah and Benjamin. And now he's wanting to fortify. He's wanting to strengthen himself to protect himself. But notice what the Lord says in verse 13. And the priests and the Levites that were in all Israel resorted to him out of all their coasts. For the Levites left their suburbs and their possessions and came to Judah and Jerusalem. For Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office unto the Lord. If you remember, of all the tribes, the priest did not receive an inheritance. The Lord was their inheritance. But God gave them cities and suburbs and places so that they could live dispersed throughout all of Israel. 
But now Jeroboam has turned all of Israel to idolatry. He sets up a calf in Bethel. He sets up a, a calf in Dan, in the north and the south, because he's afraid people are going to go worship the Lord, and if they do, they're going to resort to Rehoboam. So he turns all of the ten tribes to idolatry. And he casts the Levites out and the priests. So they decide, we're going south. We're going to go to Judah. We're going to stay there. And what's interesting in 1 Kings chapter 11, God made a promise through the prophet to Jeroboam. He said, if you will serve me as David did, I will give you a heritage like him. That is amazing. The opportunity that Jeroboam had if he would have simply served the Lord, God would have established him indefinitely. But as soon as he takes the throne, he leads them into idolatry. Verse 15 says, And he ordained him priests in the high places, and for devils and for the calves which he had made. And after them, out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord, God of Israel came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto the Lord God of their fathers. So, notice this, they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, strong. Notice before this, Rehoboam fortified the cities. He made fenced cities. He put shields and spears. He did everything that he could to make himself strong. But the scripture tells us that his true strength came when the priests, the Levites, and the godly people of Israel who fled from the ten tribes came down to Judah to seek the Lord. That is where true strength comes from. I hope tonight you've learned that or you're learning that. Strength doesn't come from your fortifications. Now, there's nothing wrong with fortifying. There's nothing wrong with having defense and those type of things. But if we trust in that, we're going to be disappointed. And Rehoboam trusted in himself, in his military might. And it's going to cost him. Real quick, for those of you who really like to dive into some things theologically in the Scripture, if you haven't heard it, you probably will hear it if you hang around church long enough, if you study the scripture enough. You'll hear weirdos, wackos, and any kind of other O's telling you that there's, there's the lost tribes of Israel. 722 B.C. when the Assyrians come in finally and take these ten tribes captive, they're lost. We don't know where the Ephraimites are and the Manassehites and all of those. And they talk about all kinds of weird, it's weird stuff. Because they're weirdos. Not being mean, I'm just telling the truth. They don't know the scripture. If you are taking notes, or if you write in your Bibles, verse 16, we just read it. And after them, after the priest and the Levites came, out of all the tribes of Israel. Is that what your Bible says? Out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem. So, at that point, in Judah, all of Israel is represented. All of Israel is represented. From all these different tribes, those who sought the Lord were there. So much so, John's back there probably biting his fingernails off because I keep, I keep going to James. James chapter 1, James says he's the servant of the Lord and he's writing to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. In James' day, there were 12 tribes. No one lost. We get to the book, book of the Revelation. I believe it's chapter 7. You have 12,000 from each one of those tribes represented they're not lost God knows exactly where they are but we've got to move on 
Well, they made him strong, notice, verse 17, for three years. For three years they walked in the way of David and Solomon. But things begin to change, verse 18. Rehoboam took him. We have this list of ladies that he took. Verse 21 says, He loved Makah, the daughter of Absalom, above all his wives. But we're told in verse 21 that he had 18 wives and 60 concubines. Now he's a lightweight concern when you compare him to his dad who had 700 wives and 300 concubines. But Deuteronomy 17, 17 strictly forbade kings from multiplying wives. And 1 Kings chapter 11 tells us that it was all of these pagan women, speaking of the heart, turned Solomon's heart away from the Lord. Turned his heart. Now here's what's interesting. Solomon, this wise man, pins the book of Proverbs and he writes Proverbs 31. He describes this amazing woman that every man should be looking for. He writes the Song of Solomon and he talks about this love for this woman. Mom, Dad, you can say whatever you want to your kids, but if you don't live it in front of them, don't expect a lot. It doesn't matter how wise you are. If you don't live it out, they won't really learn it. He follows in the footsteps of his dad, and that's just the beginning of his problems. Because he has a favorite wife, he should have only had one wife, but he has a favorite wife, he's got favorite kids. So he picks Abijah. Verse 23 says that he dealt wisely. Now that's not speaking of the wisdom of God, that's speaking of him trying to be uh, smart in his own doing. He disperses all of his other sons all over his territory because he doesn't want them to be able to amass power together and go against his favorite pick. Chapter 12. And it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. Isn't that just the way that it is? I see it all the time as a pastor. People get on fire and dedicated for the Lord committed to him for whatever reason. Most of the time, they come around because the heat's been turned up. Problems have arrived in their lives and they're like, Lord, we need your help. We're turning to you. Uh, help us out. And God starts helping things and fixing things and stabilizing things and comfort sets in, security sets in. And then things are okay. And see you, Lord. Appreciate it. I got it from here. For three years, he's been strengthened because of these priests and Levites and all of these people whose, whose desire was to seek the Lord, their heart was to seek the Lord. They came to Judah. And because of that, now he's thinking it's because of his fortified cities and his fenced cities and his spears and all of his provisions stocked up and he's ready for whoever comes along. But it, it's not. It wasn't. It's a false sense of security. And tonight, if you're trusting in any of your fortifications, it's a false sense of security. Strength comes from the Lord. It comes from, from seeking the Lord and having a heart to seek after the Lord. So Rehoboam is like the flea and the elephant that walks across the creaky bridge. Here they start off, and with every step it's making the noises and it's, it's shimmering and it's moving and it's you know, sweat popping up on your brow and they, they're out in the middle and it's, it's, it's hairy and it's scary and they get to the end of it and the flea says, wow, wow. We sure did make that bridge shake, didn't we? The flea had nothing to do with it. He's a flea, you see. 
It was the elephant. How many times am I like the flea? Boy, we sure did make it shake. We moved it. We shook it. We, we did it, didn't we, Lord? No. I did it. You just graciously were allowed to be a part of it. You know, it's like, it's like those old country boys says, we killed a bear. Paul shot him. But we killed a bear. No, we didn't. Paul did. You were just there. How many times in my life, after three years of walking with the Lord, doing it His way, seeing the fruit and the success of it, experiencing His blessing and His grace, everything going good, and I begin to slip. I begin to backslide. I begin to say, Lord, you know, I, I would be at quiet time this morning, but I'm busy, I'm busy. You know I'm busy, Lord. You know all things. Rehoboam forsook the Lord. So, verse 2, it came to pass that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, I wish it was Shishak, because I could have made a joke about Susan's she shed, but I can't now. I think I just did, didn't I? I think pastor jokes are just as lame as dad jokes. Or either you guys have no sense of humor. You need to laugh more in 2019. I'm sure I've seen that on Facebook somewhere. Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem, notice, because they had transgressed against the Lord. Oh, my fortified cities are going to take care of me. All these spears, all these shields, all this stuff, I'm ready. I'm, I'm, I've got my defense. That's what I'm trusting in. The problem is it was God that was keeping the enemy away. It was God. The problem with you and I desiring God to get out of our life or either to back off a little bit is when He answers that prayer. Now, most of us would never just verbally say it. God, back up, back off, get away. But in our actions, often, that's what we're really saying. Imagine what would happen to our most important relationships on planet Earth if we treated those individuals the way we treat the Lord. How healthy would those relationships be if I spent the same amount of time or the lack thereof? My wife wouldn't be as gracious as the Lord has been. Verse 3 says, With twelve hundred chariots and threescore thousand horsemen, and the people were without number that came to him out of Egypt. The Lubims, the Sukims, the Ethiopians. And he took, they took the fenced cities. Isn't that interesting? What's going to happen? And I've experienced this. What's going to happen when God lets you have what you're trusting in? And only that. What's going to happen when that day comes when God says, okay, I'll just step aside and we'll just see how strong your fence cities are. We'll just see, we'll see how good your credit is. We'll see how good your health is. This is your job. You got it because of your education and your smarts and your swagger, we'll just see how well you do that job when I don't show up tomorrow morning. And you're all there by yourself. I can't tell you how many times, like Samson, I've shook myself. And God wasn't there. Now, He didn't leave me. He'll never leave me. But He just says, okay, Gordon, you got this. Oh, you can teach, can you? Well, okay. Next Sunday, you got it. I've, had, I've heard pastors say, I've been doing this for 20 years. Okay. I'm not going to be at church next Sunday. <laughs> You're going to crash and burn. 
<laughs> so God backs off. You know, Proverbs 127 one says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. God says, if I'm not protecting that city, I don't care how many watchmen you keep up all night long, it's not going to do you any good. What he was trusting in didn't help him. Verse 5 says, Then came Shemaiah the prophet. And all the princes of Judah gathered together in Jerusalem because Shishak had said and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Ye have forsaken me, and therefore have I also left you in the hand of Shishak. Those are some sobering words. He was in God's hand, his protective hand. God was blessing Judah, and he forsook the Lord. He stepped out of God's hands, and there's only one place you end up. When you step out of God's hands, you end up in the enemy's hands. Those are the only two places you can be. Whereupon the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves, and they said, The Lord is righteous. We deserve this, Lord. You're right. We're wrong. And when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, saying, They have humbled themselves. Therefore, I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance. And my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak, nevertheless. If you write in your Bible, I would encourage you to underline that word, nevertheless. So many Christians have this idea, this attitude, oh, well, the Lord's gracious, He's merciful, He will forgive me. Besides, nobody's perfect anyway. I mean, come on. And you're right. He will forgive you. He is gracious. He is merciful. Nevertheless. See, that's the word you've got to, you've got to worry about. Nevertheless. There have been times in my life that God has spared me the consequences but not always. Not always. And that's what God says. They're not going to destroy you, but you're going to feel this one. You're going to feel this one. They shall be his servants, that they may know my service and the service of the kingdoms of the country. So Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house, and he took all. They lost it all all their treasure. You see, so many Christian people, they don't want to set their heart to seek the Lord. They want the blessings of God. They want all the benefits of God. But, but they don't want to be involved. They want all the treasure. They want the gifts. But sometimes without the giver. Because the giver says, okay, I'll give you that fast hot rod car. You've been wanting it for a long time. I'm going to give it to you. Great. Yes. But don't break the speed limit. What? You wanted the fast car. But you still got to follow the speed limit. Well, what good is a fast car if you got to go the speed limit? See, we want the fast car. We want to be given the fast car, but we don't want the speed limit. He took it all. And they carried away the shields of gold which Solomon had made. Remember, there were 500 of them. And verse 10 says, Instead of which King Rehoboam made shields of brass. Shields of brass. Brass for you students of the scripture, is a symbol of judgment throughout the Old Testament. The gold is gone, and now there's shields replacing it with brass. But here's the thing. You can shine brass, you can polish it, and you can make it all shiny, but it's still brass. It's still brass. How many Christians tonight are sitting in pews across the globe and they're just polished brass? 
the gold is gone. Why? Why would we settle for polished brass instead of the gold? Imagine every time Rehoboam saw those shields, he was reminded. He was reminded. It's all a show. It's all a show. And so many believers, they come to church and the gold has long since been gone. But they're polished up. They're shiny. The next two verses say that the guards would take these and, and pick them up when he would go in and out of the king's house. Verse 12 says, And when he humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him and would not destroy him altogether. And also in Judah, things went well. And now his life is summarized. So King Rehoboam strengthened himself. Notice it's always strengthened himself. He's not strengthened in the Lord. He's strengthened in himself. In Jerusalem and reigned. For Rehoboam was one and 40 years old when he began his reign. He was 41. He's 58 now that he's dying. He began to reign and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Namah, and Ammonitis. Now God's going to sum up Rehoboam's life right now. Anybody like going to funerals? Did you know that Ecclesiastes says the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth? Well, they give eulogies and they try to say all the good things that they can say about. You ever been at a funeral where the person giving the service don't know the person? And everybody in the room does. And you know that pastor, that pastor's sitting up there and he's saying, oh, Joe was a good old soul and he cared about people and he loved his wife and his kids and all that stuff. And everybody's sitting there going, he don't know Joe. If God summed up your life to this moment in one word, what would it be? Notice this. After these three chapters, verse 14, evil. Wow. That's not good. You don't have to be a theologian to know that's not good. When God sums up your life and he says, evil. He did evil, and here's why. Because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. He prepared not his heart. How much time do I spend preparing my heart? See, we, we talk about seeking the Lord a lot. But what about the preparation in seeking the Lord? Come flying up into church on two wheels. I can say that because some of you have seen me do that. Flying up in two wheels. Mind everywhere but where it needs to be. Fly up in here and just say, okay, lights, camera, action. He did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. How much time does it take for me, for you, for us to prepare? How much time do I spend preparing my heart? How do I prepare my heart? Through prayer, through being in his word, through fellowship, through worship, through obedience and applying God's word to my, to my life. But he didn't. His grandfather was a man after God's own heart. His father was half-hearted. And he prepared not his heart. You see this happen a lot in the scripture. You would think logic would dictate that with each passing generation, it would get better. 
You would think if, if, your, if your daddy was Abraham, that your name would be greater than his name, but Isaac isn't. And then there's Jacob. You, you've got David. And then you got Solomon. And now you've got Rehoboam. Three generations. Three generations. If you're surrounded by people who have set their heart to seek the Lord, join them. Join them. Don't let that pass away and not be found in you. Rehoboam, he didn't prepare his heart. And it says in verse 15 that the acts of Rehoboam first and last, they're written in the book of Shimei the prophet and of Edu, the seer concerning genealogies. And there were wars between Rehoboam and Jeroboam continually. Makes sense because he trusted in his own might. You see an individual who trusts, trusts in their own strength. You see an individual who's constantly flexing. Because they got to show it. They got to prove it. If they're trusting in their own strength, then they've got to they've they make it known. If you're trusting in the Lord's strength, you don't have to worry about that. I can just be the wimp that I am and I don't have to, I don't have to worry about it. There was war continually between them. Rehoboam slept with his fathers. He was buried in the city of David. And Ahijah, his son, reigned in his stead. We'll look at him next. Saul. He had no heart for the Lord. So God removed him and put David in his place. David served the Lord with all of his heart, his whole heart. Solomon come along. God was pleased with his request. Give me wisdom, Lord. I want wisdom. But his daddy's prayer was this. Take not your spirit from me. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Nothing wrong with wisdom. Wisdom is great, grand, glorious. But Solomon is the epitome of a man who has a bunch of wisdom. But his heart doesn't e equal it. And his son Rehoboam comes up after him. He doesn't set his heart to seek the Lord. And as a result, he, he followed bad counsel. He followed bad counsel. Now the Holy Spirit tells us that he sought the old men, he sought the young men. But there's something the Holy Spirit doesn't tell us. He didn't seek the Lord. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man, Psalm 118 says. He trusted in man. And then he fortified his cities. He trusted in his own might. Zechariah 4, 6 says, it's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And then finally, he forsook the Lord. And he faced the consequences. And the final commentary was, he did evil. Because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. I hope tonight you are among those who set out to seek the Lord. I hope you are constantly preparing your heart. I hope you're guarding your heart because out of it flows all the issues of life. All means all, and that's all, all means. Prepare your heart. Spend time with the Lord. It's the most important time you will ever spend. Yeah, but Gordon, I'm in a hurry to get to school, get to work, get to the party, get to, to this person or that person. If you'll seek the Lord first, you'll get out of school, out of work, out of the party, out of this person or that person, what God intended. If not, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss it. If you don't prepare your heart 
to seek the Lord, you're going to get to the end of your life and have missed out on all that God had for you. 2019, it's time to get preparing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much.